Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you might be in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, Faster, Better Decisions to Unlock Strategic and Organizational Value. And this is provided by Joe Geary, who's Business Design's Vice President of Customer Value. Joe gets to spend his time working with Business Design's customers all over the world, helping them identify areas where they can drive rapid value to their organizations. Now, we will be taking questions and answers, and so if you'd like to submit those through the Q&A panel, we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. And also to note, this webinar will be recorded, so if you don't manage to stay through the whole lot of it, or you want to distribute it to uh, some of your colleagues, about 24 hours after the event, we'll be sending out a link to both the slides and the recorded webinar as well. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over to Joe Geary. Joe, over to you. Thanks, Will. Uh, glad to be here and uh, have the opportunity to chat with a number of our customers. As Will mentioned, uh, I am BizDesign's Vice President of Customer Value. I joined BizDesign uh, in this role back in December. However, uh, I had leveraged BizDesign to do some very interesting things within this EA space and, and draw up some interesting insights to drive organizational value and actually had the opportunity to present at last year's user conference, uh, which, which started those conversations between Biz Design and myself to, to come on board and do the same interesting things with all of Biz Design's customers. And I've been having a lot of fun doing just that uh, this year. A um, little bit about myself. I've been in IT for uh, 30 years now uh, in a number of uh, different uh, industries uh, and a couple of different role types. Um, I've got a deep background in application architecture, software engineering, as well as uh, some senior management positions that I've held over the years. But really, you could sum up my career as having a passion for figuring out where the business is trying to go and leveraging everything digital to get them there. And that, that, that bimodal focus is really what, what drives me. And enterprise architecture, when it, when it really does focus on the business and focus on technologies to move the business forward is a really great role uh, and a good hat for me to wear. So I'm excited to be working with all of you in, uh, in doing just that, helping the business move forward. So this next slide is really um, a, a depiction of, of change and, and really company lifespan uh, as published by S&P 500 index. And what you can see is that company lifespan continues to decrease over time, uh, and the projection is even, even uh, shorter. And, and, and really what's going on here, what's causing that is change is a constant, and the need to adapt uh, is increasing. And as companies struggle to adapt to various drivers and, 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 uh, and points of change, whether it's regulatory, or competition, um, then they get displaced. So the key is how can I really keep up with change and continue to drive things forward? And as EA, how can I continue to architect the enterprise in this ever increasing change climate? So uh, a few uh, statistics or points related to uh, EA's call to action and as published by Gartner, um, and especially true in this time of uh, COVID pandemic. You know, almost 100% of companies have made budget cuts. Um, there's been a great focus on the cost of goods sold, uh, the supply chain and the corporate functions. 70% of companies have suspended their growth plans. 85% of companies have experienced a decrease in operating income. Uh, and COVID has resulted in a a significant IT budget cut uh, and this kind of attitude of you need to do more with less with a focus on cost management, but perhaps more importantly, consequence management. And all of these are, are you know, these are drivers that EA needs to be aware of and needs to assist their organizations in managing. So in other words, the change is real. It's heightened by the economical climate that we're in, and EA has a role to play in helping organizations move forward. 
So I really like this slide. Um, it depicts uh, five people here staring at, you know, what perhaps is a diagram of the enterprise. And we see a lot of complexity. There's a lot of lines, a lot of colors involved here. And, you know, you would like to believe that they're all looking at this with confidence and, uh, and you know, and how to move forward. But the truth of the matter is our enterprises are very complex. That We have different, uh, Companies uh, within a particular organization or different business units, uh, and there's multiple strategies. There's multiple capabilities, hundreds likely, uh, if you go down to level three, uh, capabilities of an organization. There's numerous processes that, that, that support those capabilities. There's organizational structure and people that continues to shift and move. Applications are coming and going all the time. The amount of data is massive. We have all kinds of technology supporting all of that. And on top of it, we have projects that are trying to get additional and new shiny objects deployed and achieve things. And so there, what I'm trying to depict here is our enterprises that we live in are complicated. And there's a lot of change all the time. And that, that needs to be taken into consideration by enterprise architecture that's trying to make sense of it all, connect the dots, and achieve uh, strategy advancement, risk mitigation, and run optimization. And it's no small task. So a lot of times what EA does is focuses on getting their arms around current state as if that's a prerequisite to get to future state. And if they boil the ocean and try to depict all the relationships of all these app and tech and strategy and projects and risks and costs, and then it can be an overwhelming task to actually try to get your arms around current state. And what happens is current state doesn't stay current very long. It continues to move with or without you. Things are going to happen. There, there's new regulatory requirements or new competitive threats or new emergency needs that need to be met. And what happens if you're trying to depict, if you're trying to depict that current state and you think that's your mission and you're manually trying to model things, uh, you can bury your enterprise architecture group's capacity in just depicting current state or trying to keep up with current state and not necessarily focusing on advancing to a better future state. So, you know, that's really the challenge. You know, um, how am I going to help make better decisions faster when organizations are big and complex, when the rate of change is continuously increasing, and when current state models are good, but, you know, they are only good if they're generating a clear line to value or supporting that. And they are challenging to keep up to date. Um, and, 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 and so what we need to focus on to, to overcome some of these challenges uh, is really we need to narrow our focus as EA to where there's clear line of sight to value. And so, for example, I could set out saying I want to conduct um, uh, business process model and or I want to conduct application rationalization or I want to conduct any number of these activities and I could say that I'm going to do this across the entire enterprise and once I'm done I'll report back my findings and that bottom-up approach can also uh, often lead to this boiling the ocean and it often can bury the limited resources of an EA group. If instead I were to shift my focus to what business outcomes am I trying to achieve based on the strategies that the, the, the business is trying to move forward, and I narrow my focus to that, I would all of a sudden also narrow my focus to a limited number of business capabilities that I need to close gaps on and mature which would then also narrow my focus to a limited number of business processes supporting those capabilities and a limited number of applications and technologies that are supporting those processes. So by starting with value and business outcome achievement, uh, 
um, I would narrow my focus to a more manageable set of analysis targets. The other is we need to automate this insight generation, this model-based insight generation in order to master continuous change. And what I mean by that is, as I, I said in earlier slides, we're dealing with very complex organizations. Change is a constant. Current state isn't staying current very long. We need to, to tie in the systems of records and sources of truth to automate the insight generation, these insights that I'm trying to provide around strategy advancement, run optimization, and risk mitigation. And I need to be able to do that easily by tying into various systems of record and refreshing those insights. So where I always recommend uh, is we focus on our stakeholders. Who is it that EA ultimately is trying to serve? And, and what are those stakeholders looking for or what do they need to be provided with in order to make better decisions? And for example, your CEO may want you know, assistance in how best to advance strategy. Your CFO and COO are gonna be interested in run optimization. How can I reduce the costs related to what we're providing? Or how can I maximize those assets that I have in production? Uh, to our stakeholders. Um, and your CRO is going to be quite as interested in risk management. So often I'll ask an EA group, if someone were to bump into your CEO in an elevator and ask them, hey, what do you think about the value of EA, of enterprise architecture? You know, what answer would they get back? Would they get an answer back that says something like, well, you'll have to check with someone in IT. They'll tell you what to EAs, or I didn't know we had an EA group, you know, but what you'd love for them to say is, hey, EA is an essential function uh, at, our, at our organization because they're helping me advance strategy, or your CRO, EA is an essential function because they're helping me sleep at night by identifying and mitigating the risks, and, and likewise, from your CFO and COO, they're helping me optimize what, what we're providing to our our, our stakeholders and contain costs. And those are the kind of things that you really want to hear uh, from your stakeholders as you. As I mentioned, you know, in order to provide these types of insights, and I'm gonna show you some of these in just a moment, but in order to provide some of these insights, you, you know, there is complexity. There's a number of different objects with relationships related to strategy and business and our application landscape and technology and projects and all kinds of stuff. And there's lots of it and relationships. So we need the models. We, we do need a solid foundation that allows us to define these dots and the connections between them. But we also need a data-driven approach where I'm automating uh, the, the, the integration of information from our application portfolio management system, if you have one from our project portfolio management system, from our CMDB, or other sources of collaboration, you know, where we don't have certain uh, sources of information. And we need to be able to drive that data in, update our models easily, refresh those insights that we're providing to our stakeholders around strategy advancement, run optimization, and risk mitigation. And if EA can do that, it's gonna be a huge home run. And so that's exactly where, where I'm helping customers focus and where business design has a big play. Another way to think about EA, and I really like this diagram, um, is often EA gets focused on this bottom half of this diagram, which is really uh, solution architecture and building solutions and adding those solutions to their portfolios and operationalizing them, supporting them, you know, deploying and supporting those solutions. And often EA misses this top half of this diagram, which is, hey, what are the needs of our customers? What are the regulatory requirements? What are our business stakeholders? What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? And I remember Gartner saying, they have yet to see a successful EA group 
uh, that isn't focused on business outcome delivery. And that's a powerful statement, and I believe it to be true. EA needs to focus here. We need to understand what outcomes we're trying to achieve as a business so that we can actually deliver the right solutions to get our business there. But, but again, focusing on business strategy. And then this notion of where do we create value? You know, how do we create value? And what capabilities are related to that value generation? And once I'm there, you could ask, well, great, I know the capabilities, let's just achieve the outcomes. And what you're going to find out is I can't because that capability is deficient, weak, immature. Um, it, you know, it takes a week to do batch processing to get, you know, whatever out the door, yet the outcome I was trying to achieve was real-time delivery. So there's a deficiency in a capability. Well, it is from those deficiencies that we see capability gaps. We need to define and fund initiatives. So EA has a play here to work with your PMO and your business stakeholders to define what those initiatives should be to maximize strategy advancement and work with your solution arcs to define those initiatives clearly and as well as possible uh, and then continue with what I'm sure you're all pretty comfortable with and is your, you know, your gravity and your sweet spot, which is the solution architecture side of the fence, the tech stuff. But it's that top half that I think we need to work on uh, as enterprise architects really focusing more on. So what we've created at Business Design is this notion of an, an organizational value assessment. Uh, and it's actually a free workshop that we conduct with customers or prospects. And it, it is to try to define where are my priorities or services that I should be providing as EA. And it's focused on these three areas. How do I accelerate strategy? Or how can I provide insights to my business stakeholders that will help them make better strategic decisions and move, move their strategy forward? Or how can I provide insights that will help us optimize operations, help me minimize cost, help me maximize value to my stakeholders all around operations? Or how can I control risk? And so through an assessment, we can start to see what is your specific priority. And, you know, are you more interested in risk mitigation than run optimization? Or is your priority strategy advancement versus risk? And, it, and, and through, through this workshop, we can get an idea of how you would rank uh, the ability to answer each of these uh, questions for your stakeholders. What is the, the, the important scale there? And from that, we have what we call value sprints. Now, Biz Design is an awesome platform it, it, you know, for doing enterprise architecture. But what we've done more recently is we've created pre-built value sets that include everything from the portal views through to the model elements uh, and extensions through to the scripting required to wire things together through to the data connectors to connect with those systems of record and sources of truth, uh, and even to the scoring models that you might need to leverage to figure out how do I score business value? How do I score technical value in order to do application rationalization? So these pre-built, all-inclusive value set, sets can get you to value quicker. And that's the whole goal. And we can base it on what are your group's priorities based on conducting an organizational value assessment. And, and it's a very rapid way uh, in a fixed time frame to get to value generation around these concepts that I'm talking about. And again, it's through a series of questions where we assess the value categories or areas of importance to you and sequence value sprints uh, to implement and generate value quickly. And here is even uh, you know some more detail that I'm I'm not going to, you know, take up all the time to get into, but I'm just showing it's it's focused value. It's putting EA in a position to, to generate organizational value around strategy advancement, risk mitigation, run optimization, 
and it's by answering or providing key insights that your organization has prioritized. And then we lay that out uh, in a timeline and, it, and we would deliver these sets of value and work with your team on an ongoing basis to actually unlock that value within your organization. So I've been talking a bit of, at a high level uh, about this concept of EA as a service to your organization, where you're really focused on working with your stakeholders to generate organizational value, uh, to drive strategy, to mitigate risk, to optimize run. I want to show you now, pivot a little bit, and, and take you through some examples. Um, so, for example, strategy advancement. You know, in this depiction, I've actually had several major companies or business units. They each have their own business plans or strategies they want to move forward with. And I want to be able to connect dots to see, hey, are we really delivering in what we're planning on doing? Um, are we really focused on uh, achieving their goals? And to what degree? And so you can see we're lighting up the goal achievement here you know, from, from high to low or not even, which brings me to conversations with these stakeholders about, hey, do you realize I'm not planning on fulfilling anything in this area of your business plan? Does that make sense? You know, is that, is that right? Or we have a high focus on this area of your business plan. Does that make sense? And these have, you know, all of these views have drill down capabilities to get to the related goals and sub goals and outcomes that you're trying to achieve. But on the other side of that are capabilities. You know, in other words, I have a strategy that I'm advancing or targeting with goals and outcomes, and I'm creating initiatives to achieve those outcomes. And therefore, uh, I have capabilities that I'm targeting uh, to advance. And again, these are more conversations with your business stakeholders to make sure you're on the same page or in alignment with what areas you're focused on advancing and what areas you're not. To make sure that once we execute these initiatives, the business is really going to get what they signed up for. And so the capability model provides a good way, uh, a Rosetta Stone, to speak in business terms about all of the initiatives that you have going on to make the world a better place. To drive that point home, if we start looking at what the financial implications of all that means, is I could look at each business segment, I can see what initiatives they're funding, I understand the relationship of those initiatives to business outcomes and strategy advancement, I can then depict out of your $100 million investment, do you realize that only, in this case, $27 million of that is going towards strategy advancement? And $75 million is not. It's funding other things with the ability to drill down and see what those other things are. Why do I want to have these conversations? Let's face it. At the end of the year, a lot of companies end up with the business scratching their head and wondering why IT didn't achieve what they needed them to get done in terms of implementing their strategy and advancing it. Well, if I can get ahead of that as EA and I can show this type of an analysis during the demand planning cycle, uh, as budgets are being made, uh, I can all of a sudden have conversations with the business to say, hey, this is the distribution of your investment. Do we need to realign things? Do we need to redefine initiatives so that more of your strategy is getting moved forward? Or are we at least on the same page that this is what is going to be delivered at the end of the year? And this is the portion of your strategy that is going to be delivered in advance. Another area. Uh, data risk. I mean, data risk is a, is a big deal. It's a board of directors level concern. Um, but too often, it, it kind of goes like this. The board says, hey, we need to focus on eliminating our data risk because we can't jeopardize our relationships with our customers. We need to protect them. We need to protect their information. And that mandate goes down through the business side. And the business often says, well, that's data. 
the data must be IT, that's an IT problem. And right there, that disconnect uh, leaves IT in a spot of not really understanding how this data relates back to what we do, uh, nor what, how to prioritize the focus of where we should be looking, uh, nor getting the, the business to, to make, take the necessary steps to mitigate risks that are identified. A capability map can achieve those things. It can keep the business in the game, uh, both in planning where to look for data risk, because the business knows what types of relationships they formed with third and fourth parties, or what types of information, uh, customer information, may be leveraged within these capability areas. So this is in very business terms, and how do I you know, define that in terms of the business and where those risks might be? And so by walking that chain of capability to process, to sub-process, to application interfaces, I can assess my risks of that information flow, yet bring it back up to the capability model so that I can keep the business capability owners engaged to identify and then mitigate those risks. So for example, I could drill into a particular level three capability, I can see which risk owners or entities are putting us at the greatest risk, uh, significant risk, what are those interfaces where information is flowing that is causing us to be at risk, and uh, drill down into all of those details. I can then decide, hey, I see this one particular fictitious, in this case, uh, vendor is putting us at risk, and these are the areas these capability areas that they are putting us at risk and get them on a call and immediately uh, makes, take action to close those, those risks. Perhaps it's something like we're transmitting data unencrypted or storing data unencrypted. And we need to take action right away. I've never seen action happen as fast, uh, by the way, as when I can get the business involved and focused on a risk mitigation item. Uh, this doesn't wait till the next year's demand planning cycle. This is show me which project teams are focused on this right now, and let's get them to refocus on closing these gaps. So again, a number of views related to closing out risk. And run optimization. You know, how do I you know, maximize the value and identify opportunities to reduce costs in what we already have in place? Well, the process of application rationalization, where we're using the Gardner time view to say, hey, um, these apps score low from a business value perspective, meaning the business has been asked a series of questions about each of these apps, and they have indicated that these applications will not meet their strategic need. They aren't a strategic fit to where they're trying to go, and therefore, there's not good alignment with their future. Similarly, on the technical side, you know, a, probably a, board, a bad cyber posture or bad architectural alignment could lead to us having a low tech health score. But based on those two vectors, we have elimination candidates or migration candidates where the business value is high, but perhaps tech health is low, or harvest more business value candidates or continue to invest. But this, this exercise gives you a good leg up in understanding business strategy and the relationship to the apps that you're currently providing, are they meeting that strategy? Along with an ability to identify quick wins based on how complex, in terms of the number of capabilities, those applications are supporting. And uh, another optimization opportunity is version currency. So, you know, you all have a lot of tech, a lot of apps, a lot of operating systems, a lot of databases, and you know, a lot of times IT shops struggle with keeping everything current. And what happens is this is a multiple CXO concern. So let me, let me tell you why that is. Uh, the CFO is going to be concerned about being on outdated versions because most shops end up paying a premium for support. So you're paying more money for less. You're not getting the latest and greatest feature sets, but you are paying an ex a premium for extended support. So the CFO is not going to be too excited about this. The COO is not going to be excited because you're on an outdated version, which likely means you're not providing the best value to your stakeholders. And the CRO, 
is going to be upset about being on outdated versions because it means you haven't deployed all of the patches uh, and, and vulnerability fixes that have been in deployed in subsequent releases. So it is a multi-CXO concern on making sure that you're keeping your technologies, your apps, your operating systems, your databases uh, current uh, or, or more current than unsupported with the ability to drill down into these areas. Uh, and, and by the way, that's a common theme as you're seeing here is provide executives with a high level insight, but allow them to drill down into all of the details. And all of this is built on top of a solid object model in your repository with relationships and objects that can be leveraged by your solution architects. Similarly, this ability to understand my costs. What is my total cost of ownership for my application portfolio? How are those cost components broken down into the subcomponents of software versus labor versus managed services? These types of insights allow EA to really focus on plays such as wow, look at how much labor is costing us on these apps, or maybe, you know, here's what we could save by moving to the cloud because we're paying an exorbitant amount of on-premise licensing costs, or perhaps we need to free up our own internal labor so that we can, by using managed services, so that we can get more projects completed on time and on budget with folks that, that have all of our enterprise knowledge. Again, capability modeling and mapping, the Rosetta Stone, you know, can I show the number of applications that are currently supporting each level three, which might give me ideas on, hey, I need to bring in a suite. Why would I need more than 15 apps supporting the single thing that we do? You know, uh, and maybe there's a cost reduction play, or maybe we shouldn't be bringing in this next app because we already have 10 of them that are doing that same thing. You know, but it gives you a very good business lens to look through when you start looking at your application portfolio from the perspective of our business capabilities. Similarly, cost, total cost of ownership of applications translated in business terms. You know, these are the more expensive areas. Does that make sense? Do we have cost reduction opportunities? Why aren't we spending any money in support of these other areas? And should we? You know, same thing with projects. Why do I have 13 projects focused on this one level three capability in the same calendar year? Do they really think they're going to be able to get the resources necessary to make forward motion? You know, or are they all gonna be competing to make the same upgrades to the same set of applications and to get the requirements from the same set of users? You know, there's going to be contention uh, like, it. and so can I get a perspective of that and talk to the business capability owners who sequence things Unsupported critical applications, uh, application business value by capability. You know, show me again where I'm not in strategic alignment with the business related to what I'm currently providing the business for each of the things that we do. And, and giving me opportunities to talk to the business about how I can get into better strategic alignment. So often I hear, you know, EA say, hey, we just want a seat at the table. That's what we want. And in my opinion, in my advice, if you want a seat at the table, you need to be able to facilitate the business to make better decisions faster. And you need to focus on value, organizational value. And you need to be able to do that. You're going to need to be data driven and create easily consumable value oriented insights. And I promise you, if you're doing that, you will have a seat at the table because you'll have something highly relevant to talk about, whether it's advancing their strategy, mitigating their risks, or optimizing their run. And trust me, when those better decisions get made faster, you're going to need all of the dots connected, the object models, the diagrams, the schemas in your repository to be able to create the solutions. And, and show those in various model forms and views and, and do all of your solution architecture work that you're likely already doing some of, uh, but, but we'll now have many more assets to build off integrated into this better, faster decision-making model. 
So, Will, that's my uh, my very uh, uh, rapid flyby over how I recommend uh, our customers, our enterprise architecture groups, focus on better, faster decision making that leads to organizational value and gets you a seat at the table with our business stakeholders. Well, thanks very much, Joe. That was a fantastic job as usual, and I'm sure everyone listening really appreciated your depth of experience, practical experience in this particular area. So we've had some questions come in, and uh, let me just go through those. We'll get to as many as we can. Again, if we can't get to them, we'll follow up, to you, follow up with you by email. And also, again, a recording of this session will be available uh, within 24 hours of uh, today. So let's go to the questions. So Joe, here's the first question coming in, and um, we've got a lot, so I'm not sure we'll get to all of them. But it asks, how do we avoid boiling the ocean? There's so many things we can do. Where should we start? That is that is a really good question, and uh, I, it is a common question, in fact, that comes up as I'm, I'm discussing uh, moving forward with a number of clients here in the EA groups. So uh, some specific advice, right? I mean, if we, for example, say we want to do application rationalization and we want to assess all of our applications from those two vectors business value and technical value. well it means i'm going to need to score each app through a series of hopefully objective questions on a common scale um, i'm going to likely need to meet with application owners or capability owners both business folks and technology folks to come up with those answers. And I may have hundreds or thousands of applications in my portfolio. So a couple pieces of advice. I would find a friendly, before starting on this type of an adventure, I would find a group, a business group, for example, where you might have some relationships or you know that they're interested in making their, their world a better place, they're receptive, they're open to some degree of change, and, and, and you know, they're friendly. So I would start with them I, and, and then get to the point of doing an assessment set with them where you're going in and trying out this new application rationalization service from EA and scoring their apps and reflecting those scores back in to the platform in those time views and quick win views and then having something to show to others who might not have been a friendly or might have been a little bit skeptical or being able to show this to your leadership who needs to be able to prioritize or sanction additional movement so starting out with a subset based on a friendly is a great idea. Also, um, you know, don't think that you have to boil the ocean from a depth perspective either. In other words, um, you may have a thousand applications, but perhaps we're going to just focus on our critical paths first, however you define critical within your organization. Or perhaps we're just going to focus on, uh, you know, all revenue or all customer facing apps or all you know a subset of your entire portfolio is another you know another piece of advice i would narrow your focus get some wins broadcast those wins to then generate more momentum to continue cookie cutting that approach across your organization thanks joe that's a great answer um i got another one coming here and i know we, we you and i have talked about this before and it's something you have some opinions on um, it's essentially what it's saying is, is, is it the fact that EA reports into the IT department that is the problem for the lack of regard for EA? Would it be better if EA reported elsewhere in the organization? What's your, what's your views on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that is also a really good question. And I personally don't believe it has anything to do with where EA reports, what department it's in. Although I will tell you this, you know, often, um, when EA reports up to IT, which, which seems to be the majority of the time, it's easy for, for those technical architects, architects who have kind of grown up, you know, and been promoted into an EA role, perhaps, um, to still have a very technical bent. And it might be out of their comfort zone to stretch into the business side of things, understanding strategy, 
value streams, value stages, business outcomes, capabilities. But I really recommend you, you do the stretch, you know, and we can help stretch into those disciplines. But, but, but if you're really focused on providing a service out of EA that is working with your stakeholders to advance strategy, mitigate risks, and optimize your run, it will not matter what department you're in because those are highly valuable services that every company needs. And you'll get seats at the table, you'll have opportunities to meet with leaders, both on the tech side and on the business side, because that's a story that everybody wants help with. And, and, and so I don't, I don't really believe it will matter. But one caveat to that, I think often EA has taken a bad rap when they've settled into this mindset that all they're really about is drawing diagrams often of current state, hoping that someone might use that information, and that's their entirety of their value proposition. And that's been coined as EA in the ivory tower. And, I, and, and, and again, it won't matter what department you report up to, if that's your mode, I don't believe you're going to see success. You're not going to get a seat at the table. So, you know, I, I don't believe it matters where you are at in the organization. I think it entirely matters on what organizational value is EA providing and, and as defined by your organization, not defined by necessarily by EA. Um, and even there again, we can help you with that assessment and that plotting the path forward. We had, I flew through those slides pretty quick, but I'd love to talk with you about an organizational value assessment. There is no charge to that. And it, it helps you define what are those services EA is gonna provide. And, and how can they provide it and equips you with all of the technical assets to actually start providing that as a, an EA service. So That's great news and I think it's probably very comforting for people to realize they don't have to be sort of organizationally handcuffed. It's about the value and impact they have on the business rather than their report lines. So That's we've right. got time, but time just for one more question and I know this is a passion area of yours. Uh, can you talk more about the Rosetta Stone and how how it can be used to speak the language of business? Yeah, yeah, and I did touch upon that, but I, I, again, I apologize for moving at about a million miles an hour through uh, the information. But but I so a capability model. If we go back to what is that? It's really um, it describes what we do uh, as an organization and. And it's down to three different levels of, of, of detail. It doesn't describe how we do it. So it's not a process model. Um, and it's not, it doesn't describe who's doing it. So it's not an organizational model. It's really a model of what makes us up as a company. These are the areas that, 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 that we have that make us up as a company. And because of that, and because it is in business language, not tech language, not geeky tech speak, not IT stuff and data and bits and bytes and techie terms, but because it is entirely in business language, what will happen is the business will instantly understand it. You will sit down with business stakeholders and you'll think you're going to need to explain to them this thing that you've created called a business capability model. And you will be amazed every time that it takes virtually no explanation because it's in their language. They understand, of course, they're responsible for billing and invoicing, which is an aspect under customer management because that's what they do for a living day in and day out. Where the power comes in, having this model, is you can start relating all of your interesting tech stuff that we propeller heads like to talk about back to the capability model so that all of a sudden business stakeholders can understand what you're trying to tell them. So for ex the example I gave earlier was this notion of where do I have risks related to sharing personal information um, and, and a breach of personal information? Where are those risks? Well, if it is left to just a tech discussion, 
you're going to hear me talk about encryption and transit, encryption at rest, and volume of data, and you know, obfuscation patterns, and you know, really geeky stuff that business people kind of you know are less interested in hearing. But if I instead aggregate up that risk and put it on to a colorized capability model, I can now sit down with a business person and say, hey, do you know the, the way we're managing our customer programs is actually putting our customers at risk? And it, it's actually pretty extensive in these areas. And I was just hoping we could talk about it. And you might find out that some of those risks in your exercise of process exploration were actually injected by the business, which is why you need to have them in the game. They may have made decisions to partner with specific third and fourth parties, and, and they made those decisions to share information with them. And they didn't have a clue that we were sharing that information in an unsafe way. And so by putting it back to a capability model, in their language, I can now explain concerns to them in a way that they can understand and take action about. And, and that, that's really what it comes down to. How can I translate things that I really want the business to understand and take action on, yet do it in their language so that they can actually take action? And there's all kinds of ways to use a capability map to achieve that. So that's, that is, that is, I highly recommend uh, implementing business capability models and maps to create that Rosetta Stone effect where you're actually speaking in the same language and moving things forward. Well, it's definitely sound words of advice. And if we can only find the right language to speak to the business, then we can really demonstrate the value of EA. But using that Rosetta Stone is, is a step along the right direction to speak their, their nouns, as For it were. Sure. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, as usual, you did a fantastic job. And thank you all to joining, for joining this webinar once more. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, we'll be following up with those uh, separately. And also, shortly after this uh, presentation today, we'll be sending out a link to the recording and the slides as well. So thank you, Joe, and thanks, everyone else. Have a good day. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Thanks, Will.